provide courage that you provide wisdom and father lord we give you all praise and all honor and all glory that is due unto your name um, we magnify you today again oh god and we ask all these things in jesus name we pray amen and amen all right so my name is shakir london and uh, as i said before i'm here on behalf of my mom and the destiny shalom outreach ministries team representing them today on the topic what every young man should know before getting married. I mean, it's, it's, it's an important topic. I still consider myself a young man. You know, I'm just a bit of information about me. I am married this year in August. My wife and I will be celebrating nine years of marriage. And we have two little ones, a, a six-year-old and a three-year-old, right? Um, I grew up in church. You know, mom, mom would make, make sure that, you know, that we would be in church every Sunday, you know, being involved in youth ministry. So I would have led youth ministry during my teenage years, been a part of worship ministry, and, and just always been a part of, of church and, and just a relationship with God. You know, um, professionally, I'm a psychotherapist by profession or counseling psychologist, right? So I, I also do that. And this topic, this topic, it allows me to draw on the the, the, my experiences with the men and the young men in relationships, because I have clients who are couples who come in for counseling. And when they come in, you know, you assess the relationship, you assess the man, you assess the woman. And sometimes when you work with the man, you realize that there are things that he needed to know even before stepping into the, the lines of marriage. And so we're gonna talk about some of those things just based on my professional experience, but even based on some of the things that I saw in my own marriage that I felt we, I should have known more about this before I got married, right? So we are going to go straight into it, right? So one of the first things I want to see, you know, in preparation for marriage as a young man, you know, um, begin to educate yourself. Begin to read books, find some books to read. It was something that my wife would um, try to encourage me to do. Um, there was a book that she was that she was reading. Uh, uh, oh my gosh, it just, it just slipped me. But there was one for the women and there's one for the men. And so she bought the two, she got the two of them. And so I had to read the male, she had to read the, the female version of it, you know, just so that we could kind of educate ourselves on, on what marriage would, would hold. Yeah, so read, read books, young men do courses, get counseling, begin to work on yourself in preparation for what marriage will hold. You know, when you, when you talk to, when I talk to men and I ask them, so tell me why you got married. I would hear, well, you know, Mr. London, I love this woman. I can't see my life without this woman. I can't, you know, I can't, I, I can't see myself separated from her. She's always been there for me. She's always been there for me. And so you have men saying those types of things as to why they would have proposed, because I like to ask that question. Tell me why you proposed to this woman. But that doesn't, those things don't always equate to a, a great husband or a great marriage. So it means that there are some things that we have to be cooking up, put, put our food to the, there's some things that we have to put into this pot to ensure that the relationship will go a particular way. I saw someone say, but men, men are from, from what, Mars? And women are from Venus? It's like two, different, two, two totally different planets. And, and we may not always understand each other. We may not always understand. We may not always see eye to eye. But yes, we are, God structured it in such a way that we, we should be joined together. And that is the first point I wanted to come to today. Um, in Genesis chapter 2 and verses 24, a man should leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. Now, so many things you all would be aware of. So there is this, there is this leaving and there is this cleaving. There is this moving away from as a, as a young man, the protection, the covering, the provision of your mother and your father and establishing or creating this thing with your wife. And that is a big thing because a lot of times when I work with men, or you, one of the complaints, or even with, with wives, one of the complaints would be, Mr. London, when, when, he, when he finds out something, some good news, the first person he calls is his mother. The first person he runs to is his mother. He goes short, difficult time. Before he calls his wife, he calls his mom, or he calls his father. And so there is that challenge that, that can sometimes, that some men have from leaving, that breaking away of that, that bond that would have been established, the protection that, that would have come. And seeing your wife 
as now part of yourself where you were cleaved onto her. She's now one with you. And that could be a challenge for some men. You know, how do I trust this woman, you know, to be a part of me, to, to embrace this thing? And you would hear some men saying, my mother is my queen. They're, they're married, you know, she's my queen. She's the most important woman, woman to me. But the most important woman to you when you become married is no longer your mother. It's your, it, it now becomes your wife. And I remember working with, with a group of young men and I would say, who is the most important person to you? Mr. London, my mother, my mother. But as a married man, that shifting ought to take place. So when I when I drive him in the vehicle before, moms used to be sitting in the front passenger seat. And, you know, and, and I remember at that time, my wife, my, at, at the time, she was just my girlfriend. She would be in the back seat if we're going somewhere together. And very slowly, that transition, especially when she became fiancé, started to take place. You know, and mom was, you know, she she understood that it was important for me to, to switch, that this, this, this change had to begin to take place because I was preparing to become husband, to become one with this person, you know? And so that change has to happen. The leaving and the cleaving. The leaving and the, I mean, and that is why sometimes I think it's important for a husband and wife when they're married to go and find a place to live by themselves away from the, the mother or the in-laws and, you know, stay away from the influence of, of, of those third parties where you create your own atmosphere in the relationship. But I will leave that, leave that right there, right? Um, the second point, for those of you that are taking notes, husband as leader. So be touching biblically for, for just for a little while. Husband as leader. And one of the first things when I, when I think about leader, um, I mean, in 1 Corinthians it, you know, 11 and verses 3, it says that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is the man. And that this doctrine globally, internationally, is, a, is, is, is doctrine that many people don't ascribe to anymore. In fact, if, if you were to, to make a statement like that in certain spaces, you might be vilified. I don't want any man to, to be the head of me, but, but, but there are a, a large percentage of women that are still looking for a man as a leader. And, that, and there are large percentages of men that still believes that their role is to be the leader, you know, in the home to be the leader of their wives. And so what does that mean if we are looking at the example that Christ said? Because that is the comparison that we were given. And one of the first things that, that I thought about that came up in, that would have come up in sessions that I would have had is, is a leader must have a vision. Where am I? Where are we going? If I were to envision my life 30 years from now, young man, what would my life look like? When Jesus came onto the earth, he came with a vision of us now being able to ask forgiveness and for sin, yeah, being able to be saved. He came with that vision. And so he understood that, yes, he was walking the earth, but a big part of it was the, was he coming on the earth to die for the sins of mankind. You know, to be um, to raise again. So there would have been this vision that he would have had. And as a as a young man preparing for marriage, I must have a vision of where my life will go, a vision of what my finances should look like, a vision of what my relationship should look like, a vision of how many children I should have, a vision of where we should live, a vision of my career. I must have these things, um, some some semblance of of or some idea in my mind of what these things should look like, young men. And it would be good to write them down. And, and for, those, for those of you who have your sons or your husbands, ask them to come and sit in and listen in. Yeah. Write it down. What is my vision for my life? Where do I want us to go? Where, where do I believe I, we should end up as husband? So that it provides a, a, almost like a finish line, something that you are running towards, that you're moving towards. And a lot of women, when you talk to them, it is like the husband does, he doesn't even know where we're going. Where are we going as a married couple? You know, and that speaks the vision, right? And, and, and obviously your wife becomes a part of that vision where you sit down and you, you can plan together and you can grow together and, and develop this, this, this idea of, of what the future holds. When we talk about husband as a leader, right? Um, we, there's a, what, we, we ask the question, what does headship mean? I, I believe a lot of times we, we, we think of leader um, we think of the term leader 
in the way that we know it, and we don't always measure it against who Christ was. Because if we, if we think of Jesus as leader based on how we see leadership now, you know, um, we may think of Jesus Christ as having coming on the earth as a, with a crown on, on his head. He as the king of kings on, on the earth here and taking charge of everything, throwing over the Roman government and everything. But he did not come that way. He was a leader, yes. But he came humble. He came as a servant to the people. Yeah, he came healing the sick. Yeah, and, and, and so it means that even as a, a as my in my role as leader of my home, of my wife, you know, I am I am there in a in a servant leadership capacity. You know, I am there to protect. Yeah. Um, I did not come to to um to dictate. Well, because I say this, she must do this, which is how a lot of men see leadership. She must do what I say to do, when I say to do it, and how I say to do it. And if that is the approach to leadership, then that, that is an approach that can bring destruction to your marriage. Yeah. And so as a young man, begin to, begin to study Jesus and his role as leader of the church. You know, how he, 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 he lived that out. It, is, it goes beyond having power and authority, which is kind of how we see it, you know? Um, yeah, he came to heal, he came to give them hope. He was a servant leader, he protected, right? Another thing that, um, that, that, that comes to the surface when we talk about, about leader is that sometimes it is a saying, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Sometimes as the leader, it, it, yes, you, you carry a lot of weight with you. And I want to say, young, young man, young men, I personally believe that God will hold husbands responsible for what happens to the marriage relationship and to the family. Now, that is a very sobering statement, you know, but it is something that I believe because if he has put you as the head of it, then it means that you have to give an account as the head. As much as Jesus would have come to the place where he prayed and said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass away from me. But if it's your will, let it be done. It is, it, God said, continue. In other words, this is, this is the position that I have placed you. This is, the play, this, is, this is the position. This is the responsibility that I have given to you. And young man, God will give you the responsibility as head of your home. And so, that that knowledge means that you know what what am I am I going to do everything to fight for the health and the well-being of my relationship? And that is a good thing to, to um think about even before you get into marriage. Because we have what more than 50% or roughly 50% um divorce rate taking place now. If 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 God holds me accountable, then it means at least from my perspective, I have to do everything in my power to ensure that my marriage is successful, that my marriage works, because I have to give an account. But th there's a lot of weight that comes with it. And Christ was carrying the whole weight of, of, of being, of, of coming to a place where he had to die for, the, for his church, for his bride. And part of him wanted, you know, felt that maybe uh, this cup could pass from me. Maybe I didn't have to carry this. You know, maybe there's another way. But God is saying that, no, this is your responsibility to take. And I'm saying to the young men, it, could, it will get heavy at times. It will be, it will be challenging at times. And I, as I say to my, my um, um, husbands and I work for them, um, I say sometimes, you know, when I, I like to think of, of Jesus walking towards the cross and that, that night with them spitting on him, they're placing the crown of thorns on his head, whipping him. Yeah, chastising him, laughing at him. And, and something you would notice from that scene, I mean, if you watch Passion of the Christ and those types of movies, one of the things you would notice is that he continues to step. At any point in time, he could have said, he could have, he could have, he could have stopped and said, no more. I cannot take any more. This is enough. But he continues to step. One step after the next. And sometimes as husbands, yeah, but the Bible says love, I'm going to come to this one, huh? um, love, love your wife as Christ loved the church and lay down his life for that stepping, 
in the midst of the weights that you carry, in the midst of the struggles that you face, in the midst of she may be from Venus and you may be from Mars and you may not understand her. You, you may not understand why she's operating in a particular way. You may feel disrespected. You may feel hurt. You may feel chastised. But Jesus did not stop stepping. And I'm saying to you, husband, you keep stepping. Now, this is something that you, you ought to know even before you're married. Because there will be times where you would feel like, you see, like, see this thing is too much. It is too much. I can't carry anymore. I, I have to give up. Yeah. So it's the, the third point. And I, and I hinted to it just now. Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 25. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave up his life for who? So a question that comes to mind is what is love? You know, sometimes we think of love as these, as these emotions. Oh gosh, these feelings are so in love. I can't sleep, I can't think. And, and if you would remember, or if you would know for those of you that might be dating, those of you that might be engaged, you, you, you can't seem to breathe without this person for the first, from the time you get up in the morning, you want to call them. You're spending hours on the phone. You all know what I'm talking about for those of you that are married or you're in a relationship as the case may be. You're in love with this person. And sometimes we see love as just this emotional bond, this connection. I mean, and that is a big part of it. But when we look at Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it gives us some more context. It provides some more shade in terms of what love really looks like. A big part of what love is has to do with changes that, that, that would occur on the inside of me. So it, it goes on to, it goes to describe um, love as being patient. Am I patient? That is something that I have to work on within, within me. Am I patient? When she's taking long to get dressed and you, you have to reach to the place for a certain time. It, wait, wait, it's going on. Come how much things. You ain't put on your makeup yet. You're still doing your hair. Wait, is happening. The, the, the show ready to start. No patience. I'm speaking to myself too, right? Love is kind. Am I a kind person? Is that who I am? Or am I only kind to people who are kind to me? Yeah. Love, with love there is no envy. So she, she gets her degree. We celebrate that because it means that, 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 that when she succeeds, you succeed. She, she earns more money than you. Celebrate that too. Because when she succeeds, you succeed. Love is not envious of. Love takes no record of wrong. Oh gosh, that, that's a big one. It means that no matter what this, this, what my wife would have done, I have to come to a place where I can forgive her. Hey boy, that is not an easy thing. And this is something that as a young man, before I get married, I need to know these things because this is what God expects of me. Love is not easily angered. These are things that I have to work on. So if I realize I have an anger problem, or I realize that when I don't get my own way, I fly off the handle. Or when I feel like I am the victim or I'm being blamed, or when I feel like I mess up, or when I feel like, 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 you know, when I when I feel like that, like I'm feel like, like, like she's coming along on me for something. Do I, how do I respond? Am I the type of person that will jump in the car and take a drive and disappear for the, for the rest of the evening? Am I the type of person who will mash up everything in the house? Or the type of person that will come to church on Sunday, but, but curse some four-letter word come Monday and Tuesday? Or am I the person that will tell her how she's at this and she's at that and she's not good for this and she can't do anything? I'm, I'm, is that the type of person that I am? Yeah. Am I the type of person that will get physically abusive and, and hold her and push her and, and choke her? Is that the type of person that I get when I'm angry? Because according to the scripture, that is not love. And so we are seeing here that love is more than just these, gosh, I can't do it out here, baby. I love you so bad. It's more than just that. There are some changes that ought to happen inside of me. And that is why I, I mentioned from the very start, begin to read the books, begin to do some counseling, begin to work on you, begin to work on you. 
Because if you aren't able to demonstrate some of, the, some of these things, then one could question whether you are ready for a marriage relationship. Yeah. And, and you know, in my life, I always try to go back to, to that scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, go back to it, because that is the example. If, if, if the scripture is love, your wife has Christ loved the church and gave up his life for it, boy. He will die for this woman, boy. That is, that is not an easy thing. That is knowing that if somebody comes into the house, you will do whatever you have to do to protect her. Jesus did what he had to do for all of mankind. That is love. It is not a, it's more than just the, the feelings and the desire, right? Love is not self-seeking. That's another one I forgot to mention. It's not just about me. And I think that marriage sometimes really brings that to the surface that we tend to be very self-seeking and very selfish, both men and women. You know, we, we fight for what we want, what we believe, what we think to be right, how things should be done. And so I am from Mars and she's from Venus. I'm seeing things a particular way. It should happen like how it's happening on Mars and she's thinking it should happen like how it's happening on Venus. Yeah. And, and, and so I'm only considering what I think, what I feel, what I believe. That is, according to the scripture, that is not love. Even if as the head, I, make the, I, I end up making a, a decision for, for our home. That is not love. And then the next thing too is, in fact, I will come to that in a little bit. Under love, I want to also mention the importance of, of maintaining the, 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 the health of your relationship. Continue, continue to date even after you're married. I mean, I have couples that come in and I would ask them, when last you all went out? So London has been a whole year. We haven't done anything. We, have, we, don't, we don't go anywhere. We go to work and we come home. But dating or the idea of dating is something that ought to be happening on a constant basis within your home. It, it ought not to only be um, spared by the husband. It, it can also be done by the wife as well. But it ought to be something that happens as often as you can. And it doesn't often always require money. A date could be a movie night at home with popcorn and, and you, you dim the lights and you spread the sheets on the ground and, and, and you, know, you set the atmosphere. Yeah, But we have that time that we're sowing and we're pouring back into the health of our relationship. So that dating ought to continue. When last have I carried my wife on a date? I would make her feel special, feel appreciated. Those are important things. And if it is not happening, then I'm saying to you, young man, when you're, when you're preparing to get married, that is something that, ought, that needs to happen. I also tell couples, it is not the, the healthy things or the good things in the relationship that causes the marriage to fall apart. It is the parts of the relationship that, uh, that you all are not dealing with, that are destructive in nature, how you treat each other when there's conflict. You know, what happens when you are angry? Those are the things that cause the marriage to fall apart. And so in the same way, even when I'm upset, I ought to still be um, displaying love. Even when I'm upset. You know, and I remember, you know, with, even with my wife and I, it's something that we talk about, you know, early in, in our marriage. And when we are upset, we will still, if I'm washing clothes, I, I'm still washing everybody's clothes. You know, if she's putting out her plate of food, she wouldn't put out her plate of food. Even if she's upset with me, she wouldn't put out her plate of food alone. And these are things that you, sometimes you, you grow to them. You, you know, you grow, but there must be that willingness to grow and to change. And that is the point I want to make young men. That when you get married, there must be that willingness to grow because marriage is like a mirror. It holds a reflection of you. All your good qualities will show up, but all your bad ways will show up as well. And your wife will be, will be able to see them and, and she will show them back to you. And so there must be that willingness to grow, to work on the, the things that, that cause this relationship to suffer. Pride, I feel like I'm too good to change. I can't apologize. I can't forgive. Yeah, all of these things are important. Right? So we're moving on. What does she need? Commitment. Commitment is very important. Just give me one second. Let me put on the light in this room. I didn't put on the light, so just give me one second. All 
right? I don't know if it, if it made much of a difference, but commitment. It is very, very important to the longevity of the relationship. One of the, one of the things that I see time and time again that is usually very destructive to our marriage is when there's in, infidelity in our, in our marriage. When someone steps out of the relationship, that could destroy a marriage. And, 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 you know, commitment could be difficult, especially if I've come from a past where I've been very um, sexual. I've had a lot of sexual relationships or a lot of sexual partners. And so I'm, I'm not committing to a marriage relationship. And there's a requirement that this is the person that, this is the person that I am with for the rest of my life. And, and what happens, what I find happens sometimes for a lot of men, when things aren't going well, there's, a, there's always someone else that provides a listening ear, another woman, someone else that you, that you, all of a sudden you can talk to this one and they just seem to understand you so much better than the person that you're with. This is a big problem in a lot of relationships. And so, yes, I'm married here, but I have, this person here, whether the person is on the job or whether this person is from my past or from a past relationship, or I, I just can't seem to, to, to have some type of control over my sexual appetite. And so one of the big things that I work with husbands on is, is protecting your marriage relationship, not from the other women out there, you know, protecting your marriage relationship from yourself. Because for every man that is on the platform, you would know from the time puberty hit, this, this thing started to well up in you, this desire for sex, this desire, yeah. To, yeah I mean, and we see the whole social media is, is when you go on Instagram, it's all the pretty women and all the poses and all of this. And we, we are very, we live in a world that sexualize a lot of things. And, and, and it, it, I guess it, it, it gathers a lot of, of income and money because men tend to be gratified and men tend to go after these things. And so they will, you know, they will go after. And so it means that this desire to go after, this desire to conquer, this desire to, to have sex with, with, with this one or with that one, that is something that I have to have control, self-control. It, it, is, it is not an easy thing. But it is something that 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 one can, with, with God's help, have some measure of discipline, some control over. And that is important because that can destroy your relationship. And so I, I protect my marriage from me, gentlemen. And so from the time this young lady come and you see she's acting too flirty, 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 this stuns. Yeah, I have to be able to see it. I have to be able to see it. I have to be able to know that um, there's a part of me that needs to feel um, what? It needs to have emotional intimacy, needs to have that bond. And so I have to be very vigilant because if I'm not vigilant, there will be women that will come for you, married man. Young man, there will be women that will come for you if you're married, just because you have a ring on your finger. And so there has to be that, that measure of commitment. This is the person that, that I have chosen. Why did, and that's why I go back to, why did you marry this person? Go back there. This is the person. There will always be a, a pretty woman. There will always be another woman that is smart or intelligent or is ambitious, ambitious or is supportive or is caring. They will always have other women like, like, like that. But I have chosen this one to be my wife. And so this is the one that I choose to be committed to. Right? I mean, that's a, that's a big one, but it's important. Protect your marriage from yourself. The, ne the next point. Prepare young man for the different seasons that will come with marriage. There will be, a, there will be many different seasons that you will face. And this is something for me that I... I just wasn't aware of even before I got married. So for example, childbirth is a season. A lot of marriages fall apart during the first year of a child's life. And, I mean, and I see it in, in, in fact when, when I do counseling because when, I, when, when, I, when, I, when they give birth, when they, when they give birth, first of all, it's a stressful time. They're not getting enough sleep. 
right? And there's some things that you lose there during that time. You lose the ability to be intimate in the way that you would have once been during that first year. Yeah, there's a, there's a loss of freedom. A lot of a lot of men. So now I can't just go out as I used to go before. It was just me and my wife. I could have just you know thing one line with friends or whatever. No, I'm more required to be at home to to give support to be there. And so this is just one season. Death is another season. You know, whether it is a loved one, financial crisis or financial changes or instability can happen. All of these are seasons that people go through in their marriage. And these seasons can make the marriage relationship become very, very difficult. And so it is important to, to be prepared for when those seasons come. Mentally, emotionally. Yeah, and the awareness is the first part. Once you are aware, it means you can be more pre prepared for it, right? Um, prepared for the losses, yeah, the loss of your singleness, the ability to say, I just go down to town and come back. You know, there's someone that you are accountable to now. I just go in and lie with my friends whole evening and come home three o'clock in the morning. The loss of freedom, the loss of the independence that I once had. These are things that a lot of men aren't prepared for. And women as well. Eh? I mean, but you know, today we're talking to the young men. And so they're, they're, they're being prepared for that shift in your life. It's more than just saying, I love this person so bad and I want to marry them. There's some things that you will, that will change. So there's some losses that you will have and some gains. But I have to be prepared for that, for, for those things, for those changes and those changes in seasons of, of my life, right? I mean, and just like you, you will change your clothes, the type of clothes you wear, like for those that live abroad, and so, you know, you, you put on your jacket and it, and so in the cold weather, and in the summer, you put on your light clothes. In the rainy weather, in Trinidad, you walk with your umbrella in your car, or you, or you travel with it. In the dry season, you, do, you could afford not to. You know, so you, you're able to, to make some changes depending on the season of your life. And in the same way, when you go through different seasons in, in your marriage, be prepared to adjust, to adapt, to change during that time. Generational curses and generational choices. This is the next point. Being very aware, young men, of what has happened in, in, in your family tree or in your family line, even before you were born, being very aware of what took place with your mother and father and their relationship, and being very aware of what you would like to see take place in your marriage. That awareness gives you insight in terms of in, in, insight in terms of how to pray, uh, as well as what are the things that you may need to work on. There's some things that, some generational curses that you may have to get deliverance for, to break when you've seen a pattern happening throughout the course of, of, of your family, your family line, or some choices that seem to be uh, made by the men in your family. I remember one young, one, not one young man, but one gentleman said, Mr. London, I realize I, I'm just like my father. I remember as a little boy, my father and my mother separated and I went and I stayed spending some time by my father. And to the best of my knowledge, mommy and daddy were still in a relationship. But every time I go by daddy, there was a different auntie there. There was a different auntie. One time the auntie have an accent, she from this country. Next time the auntie this and, 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 his, and, and he grew up and he lived out the same life. So he had wife, but he had this one, and he had that one. And he was able to come to a place where he realized that he, it's like a, the, the same type of relationship that his father had, or, or the way that his father conducted his life was the same way he conducted his. And, and he was able to see that this led to a lot of broken homes and a lot of pain because he had children here, children there, children across there, and so on and so forth. Yeah, it may be that it may be it may be alcohol or alcoholism. Yeah, it may be smoking. It may be abuse. Yeah, in the way that my father would speak to my mother or my grandfather, or as the case may be, it may be neglect or abandonment. I say to to men, um, and young men that I work with, that 
your father teaches you even in his absence. So if you've never known him, he's never been in your life, he's taught you that it is okay for a man to not be there. And sometimes we grow up and a little pressure come in the relationship and you leave and you're gone because it's, you've been taught to not, be, to not be there. All of these are things that, that pass on from generation to generation. And so I'm saying, young know, man, take a, take a second and look back. Look back at mommy and daddy, daddy in particular, at his behaviors. Look back at how he treated your mother. Look back even at the type of woman that he chose in your mother, because more than likely you will choose the same type of woman as your wife. Look back at your grandfather. Look back at your father's relationship with his father. Look at your, look at your um, father's relationship with his mother. If they are alive, you, you observe these types of relationships because they are very indicative of what you may end up um, stepping into in your marriage relationship on our ways. Because I believe a, a, a large part of our lives, we live it in, um, what is the word? In, uh, it's as if you're, you're living it in automatic drive, where you don't have to think about it. You, you put the car in drive and the car just goes. You don't have to think about shifting the gears. It's an automatic. And so you will automatically choose a woman with qualities like your mother if you are not conscious. Let's say your mother, let's say your mother has some qualities that you that you don't really like. So if you are not aware, and you know, you may end up choosing certain as someone based on certain qualities. Yeah, you may choose someone that makes you feel ridiculed or less than or not good enough or whatever. And these are things that that so these are things that you have to be aware of. And, 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 and make certain changes, treating with yourself as the case may be, right? And so when you've identified these things, you go and you get counseling, you go and you get help to unpack how these things have affected you, how your life even now as a young man um, is influenced by what you've been through. And you, and, and you have someone that has helped you to, to, to adjust and make some of the adjustments or some of the changes that you need to make before you step into a marriage relationship. Because from, from, my, from where I sit, when I work with couples, most of the times when couples come in for counseling, I ask myself, what? They, they don't seem to be prepared for, for what a marriage entails. How can you get married and you haven't dealt with this or you haven't dealt with that? but you haven't dealt with the other. So dealing with me, right? Yeah. Responsibilities in the home. We live in a time now where there are, where, where there are um, shifting, a lot of shiftings or shifting that would, that would, that, that has taken place in terms of responsibilities in the home. Back in the day, the man, as you all know, would have been the breadwinner. You would go out, you would work, you would bring the income. The woman was the, the, the person that took care of the home. Everything that dealt with the family and the home, the wife dealt with it and the husband brought in the income. Largely, that was, that was what, how, it, how it was. That has changed now to such an extent where women are, are now also going out to work, right? And so there's been that, that adjustment. And um, because of that adjustment, there's more income coming into the home, right? But also with that adjustment, there, there's, there's often the expectation that I've found that my wife will still do everything concerning the home, from raising the children, cleaning the, and the maintenance, everything to do with cleaning and maintaining the home. It is all on her. And I want to say, gentlemen, that that approach, um, is not a healthy approach for your relationship. Because if, if she goes out to work and you go out to work as well, and she has to take care of all the children, prepare all the food, all the meals, including yours, clean all the rooms, the bathrooms, the bedroom, the everything, you know, wash, sweep, mop, everything. That is going to leave for a very um, dissatisfied, um, and unhappy wife in a relationship. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm, it's important for me to raise this point. Um, it doesn't mean that, that one party doesn't do more than the other, you know, but it means that I, have to, I must be mindful of the person that I'm married to and, and what they do 
in terms of our marriage life and so on. So, so some men are uncomfortable changing a pampers, changing a diaper. You, you, you're uncomfortable even being left at, at, at home alone with the child. Yeah, it is like that is her responsibility totally. Don't even leave that child home. In fact, when she when when she's gone and she leaves the child home with you, you're calling every five minutes. Where you? How long are you taking again? You can't reach home yet. What is going on? Because you, because there's this, and this is this is what we don't talk about. There's this fear. There's this fear that I am not good enough to be a nurturer for my child in the way that the child needs. And I want to say, gentlemen, that you can. And, but this is also for the larger, everyone listening, you know, how we raise our boy children. It is still important for, for your son to grow up knowing what it means to be a nurturer, to give love and affection to his child. And so he distances himself from everything concerning the, the care of the, ch the children. Not only that, he doesn't cook. He ain't washing clothes. He's not sweeping. There's nothing that he does in the home. And I'm saying that I ought to be able to provide some measure of support to take the load off of the person that I'm in a relationship. It doesn't make me less of a man to stick up a broom and sweep the, the living room that I live in from time to time. It doesn't make me less of a man to say, all right, this weekend I'm cooking. I'm cooking for the family. Darling, you just sit down there and I'll put out a plate and everything for you and for the children. It doesn't make me a less of a man to do those things. In fact, it may, it may very well lead for um, a wife who is more appreciative of your role as husband. Yeah. And so you provide a certain measure of support in that capacity and not leave everything on her, which is what happens um, in many homes. And, I, and this challenges a lot of men. I know a lot of men um, don't ascribe to it. I mean, I work with a lot of men that will say to me, Mr. London, I ain't doing, I'm not doing that. But then your wife hints at divorce. She hints at it because she's overwhelmed. And I mentioned earlier, the willingness to make adjustments and to change. That willingness is important. Yeah. Um, it, it, I mentioned earlier, there's, you know, sometimes it could be a, a lot of weight as a man in the home. And part of that weight comes because um, men, men step into marriage. One of the first things, if you ask any young man what it means to be a man or to be a husband, he will say to provide. Anyone. Provision, we were almost hardwired in that way. And so a man has to always be thinking about how he will earn or what he will earn or his ability to earn. Now, a challenge with that is if you have a very poor work ethic which is one of the things as a man, your, your work ethic, your ability to work, that is something that you want to, to have established before you get married. So that period of time where you finish your studies and whatever, and you, you just sit down at home relaxing, yeah, yeah, that can be the time where you're thinking about, all right, let me look to get married to someone because marriage comes with responsibilities and a big part of it is financial responsibility. And a man ought to be able to provide. And so that ability to get up, and to, to look for the work, look for the job, to earn the income, to have some type of ambition to develop yourself, gentlemen, so that you are you that your family um lives in a in a space where they're not living in a place of want, always in need of this or that or the other. Yeah. So the more that you can do before you get married to put things in place educationally in terms of, 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 um, of your, having your own home, you know, those are put those, put, having your own vehicle, putting those things in place can go a very long way in terms of being able to take care of your home in, in that aspect, being able to provide. That provision is important. Going out there and, and, and working. You know? I mean, I remember when I finished school, you know, your home and you just kind of, lazy and around, but my father was one, he always felt, you know, a man must work. He would always have me wanted me. So I had a lot of different jobs that I did, you know, because he, he believed a man must work. And I mean, and it is important, his responsibility in that regard, right? But it can be, it can be, and this is, I guess, for the women on the platform, 
when he loses his job, or when he isn't able to earn, but there's a desire to, that can be a very frustrating thing for a man. And men don't always deal with it in the right way. They don't always talk about it, you know. Um, you know, I always say that, you know, my wife, she will come and she will say, you know, let's go. We go in the mall and she want to buy this and she want to buy that and, you know, let's get this or whatever. But at the back of my mind, I'm thinking, all right, we have to balance this budget. Okay, cool. If we get this, how we think, and how we, how we, we juggle in this. It's always there, ladies. It is always there. And this is, I mean, this is me generalizing. Obviously, it wouldn't be the same for for a hundred percent of the men, but I believe for a majority of men, they're always thinking about how this is going to to work out. Yeah, in his and, and his capacity and his and his ability to provide for his family. Right. Um, so with that, the, the, the need for financial planning, gentlemen, the need for, for savings, for having financial discipline, that all my money ought not to just go to spend and whatever, but I ought to get into the practice of saving. If I plan to get a home, usually if you plan to buy a home, you need to have 10%. If you want a home for a million dollars, you save a hundred thousand dollars. And so you're, you're planning along those lines. Most of the time, that is kind of how it would go unless you have a, you inherit a home as the case may be. But you're always, um, there must be some financial planning for the things that you want to attain financially within the home. Because you will marry someone who may want to go over the kitchen or she may want to, you know. And so your ability, the better you are in terms of your ability to save and to plan financially and to work with your wife and, and, and in that planning aspect, um, the better you all will be in the long run, right? In taking care of the, the home, in taking care of the children. That's another one. Um, I had a friend, I, well, I have a friend he would always say he would walk past the, the, the aisle in the grocery, the children's aisle when he's making groceries. He says he, does, he doesn't have any children, but he would walk, it, walk through the aisle just to remind himself why he does not have any children as yet because of the prices of the pampas and the price of milk and, 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 and everything that, that, that children need. But I'm saying to say it could be very costly to have a child. And so even having a child, that is something that you plan for financially. You put things in place for because because it will it can add an additional strain on your marriage relationship when that time comes right whether you want to put your child in a private school or you know these are these are additional expenses where your child gets sick and and the hospital is it takes too long for them to get care so you go privately these are things that you have to that 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 will come once you decide to have children you decide to have a family you get married these are things that will come. And so these are things that you have to have at the back of your mind that you're planning for, right? And the Bible talks about leaving a legacy for your children, for your children's children. And so from the time you get married, you know, the expectation is you are going to have children. And with that, you are going to have to leave a legacy for your children. And, and that is something I know that, um, I don't know if it was last week or week before, um, Dr. London would have mentioned that she had um, a close friend of our family on doing a, a financial planning or management session um, on the same platform. And it, it is so necessary because we tend not to think about down the road in, a, in any meaningful way. We live for what is happening now. So we don't really plan for when I am no longer here. What happens when I go, when I die? What happens to the children? You know, when, when we have one house with four children, and they can't decide what is going to happen. Who wants to sell? Who wants to keep the house? And so the house stays there and collects bush and overgrown and whatever, whatever, because we can't decide. And so it means that as a parent, you have to, it is your responsibility to put things in place. You know, your, your legacy, get our will done, you know, begin to set aside what is for what, who is for who, whatever as the case may be, right? Um... Support systems. This is this is probably the second to last point. Your support system as a as a married man. I did not realize until I was married the importance of having um rela good relationships with other married men, other men that go through what you go through, that will experience what you experience. You know, 
Um, and even in terms of support systems and relationships, there must be gentlemen are pulling away from who you would consider to be your female friends. That is not something that we talk about very often, but my, I can still have friends who are females as the case may be, but my relationship with them must change when I'm married. Yeah, it must, I can't be calling this person every week and every month and as the case may be. No, there must be these boundaries that, that I have to establish to protect my relationship. And I mean, I spoke about that a little bit earlier, right? But, but, but as I was saying, um, friendships, male friendships with, with, with men who are also married like yourself, men with probably children like yourself, so that you can talk about and just kind of lean on each other. Christian men, it's important. Because women have their friends that they will talk to. And you know, women talk as a way of processing, so they will talk. But men, we tend to keep things inside. And what tends to happen is because this man has, he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not a, a, as good a communicator, let's see. And so he doesn't have the large um, cadre of friendships as his wife may have. He may have one, maybe two, maybe even no real close friends. You know, it's so important to establish bonds with other males, whether it is in the church, you know, other married Christian men that you can talk to, that you can liaise with, that you can rub shoulders with, you know, and, and, and spend time. You go out for an evening and, you know, you, you just talk a bit about it because that helps to, to gain perspective. A lot of times men live in bubbles. And when I work with, with men and we have, and I bring groups of men together, you would hear a man say, um, Mr. London, when I get back, when I get angry, I'm, I'm not speaking for two weeks. And another man might say, two weeks? I, I, boy, you can't do that, or able to do that. And so he now is able to hear from other men that way. All right, so this is not something healthy that I've been doing. He might not have heard his wife, but when he comes and he rubs shoulders with these other men, he would realize, okay, no, I realize this is a problem, I have to change this. Or, or he may realize that his problem is not as bad as he thought that they were. But it is good to have other men like that, like to provide some measure of support, a support system for a married man. Yeah. Um, and finally, the last thing is your own, your, your relationship with God, your personal relationship with God. You know, um, that, that will, will um, help to sustain you in your marriage relationship. And that is so critical. You, it, it is not something that you that you can afford to lose as a married man. Because there's a devil who is like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. His, his goal is to steal, to kill, and destroy. And the Bible says that the first thing that they do is they bind the strong man. So if he could bind you up as husband, as head of the home, he has free access to go in and spoil the home. And that means that your relationship with God must be paramount where you are praying and covering your family, yeah? your children, your wife, you have to cover them. And so you pray and you declare that over them every single day. Every single day, you cover them because you know that there's a devil out there seeking to destroy. Seeking to destroy. You know, one of the things that I've been trying to work on is to, is to allow my personal relationship with God to be a bit more visible to my children, you know? Um, because usually when I have that one-on-one, -on -one, it's just me and God, you know? It's that early morning or, or in the night or whenever time in the day where it's just me and God and uh, where I pray on the inside, you know, I spend that time praying. But but it is important as, as a man for my children to, to see that in daddy, you know? You may find that the woman might be more expressive in terms of how she prays and so on, but it, it is important for them to see daddy in that role as priest in the home, as leading the home, as pastor of his own, of his own family, you know? And so that is something that I have been working on, you know, so that they will see me praying more, that they will see, I mean, well, they see me going to church, but that, that you know, that they will see me having that trust in, that faith in God, you know? in terms of how I lead um, my family. And that is important, not just for them to see, but also for your own personal well-being. When Jesus needed a time away, he would go away in the night 
away from all the disciples and everything, and he would have that one-on-one -on -one with God, and then he would come back. And it's important to be able to take that time away at times, to reconnect, to, to, to have that one-on-one -on -one with God, so that he strengthens you, because it, it is not an easy thing to, to be the one that carries the, the, the role of headship. It doesn't mean that you that she is less than, and I probably should say that it doesn't mean that you are more important to her, important than your, than your wife. It doesn't mean that at all. You know, she's just as valuable in the eyes of God, but it means that you will be held to, to um, some, you will have some more accountability um, or, or you will have to, you'll be more accountable to God for, in your role as, as father, as head of the home. And so that personal relationship helps to strengthen and helps to keep you when things come from left field and all kinds of issues happening in the relationship, right? So I hope that this such segment was beneficial. I mean, I, I know it's 5, 504. So I guess we, I, I have no problem with, with, with us showing out some questions. I'm sure I probably missed one or two things, but that's okay. I still think that, you know, we would have covered a lot of things based on my experience working with men and even my own personal experience of things that we should know even before we step into our marriage relationship. So if you have a comment or a question, feel free. Um, you can put it on the chat. Um, or, or you could even unmute your mic and, and throw it out and we could talk about it a little bit. You know, I, I don't want to, I can't presume that I know everything. I, I don't know everything. And, and I'm sure there may be things that I may have missed as well. Yeah, so anyone feel free to unmute your mic or to put, a, put something in the chat. But boy, no statement, no questions, no comments. Everybody's good. Could be that you just have some thoughts about something that was shared, you know. Feel free to unmute. All right. Pastor Dex, you there? Um, Minister London. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Yes. Um, Minister Petronilla here. Thank I'm you so fun. much for that delivery. Okay, mm -hmm. you hearing me? Yes, I'm hearing you. Right. Is there a forum that... um? You know, sometimes I would hear you on the radio stations in the night on your 98 and stuff. But um, are you satisfied with the, 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 the forums? Is there enough forums that, you know, is telling or advising or teaching men, you know, how to treat women, the needs of women? Because, um, you know, times pass. I see it's changing a bit. You would hear men telling, um, you know, even women telling the younger women, um, you know, don't treat a man like this. So you have to know how to treat a man. And is everything is about the man and the man. Uh, do you think it is enough literature is being um, shared in the public domain to, to men how to treat? the sensitivity of women, the different intricate um, things in women, you know, with relationship wise, how to please your woman, how to treat her, you know, what she needs. Do you think enough is being shared? Just a question. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Um, this, this actually, your question is a conversation that I had just this past week with another gentleman um, and he was asking the same question. Now, for the year so far, I think I've had four, I've been on four, been at four forums, men forums, um, treating with issues like this, right? Do I think that enough is being done? I think my answer to that is no, but I think that, I, I, I think that we are not, uh, we, we have not normalized having conversations like these. Um, where men can come and, and learn. Um, and probably that is, it can be a role of um, the men's ministries in church 
in churches where we can have conversations about what women need, you know, in addition to helping men, you know, providing support for what men may be going through. Um, so I believe more that more needs to be done. Part of it also has to do with whether a man is is puts himself in a space where he's willing to learn. I think that if I'm if, if the man is willing to learn, he will seek out and he will find spaces where he will gain this type of information. But it's easier said than done. I also believe, Minister Petronella, that a big part of, of what we expect, what you describe, um, is something that we ought to be teaching our our son, both, both our sons and our daughters. Um, or to be, in terms of teaching our son what it means to be to, 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 to treat with the needs of a woman or of his wife. You know, um, we don't teach our, our, our boy children that, that. We don't, all, and we, at the same time, we don't always teach our young, our daughters that as well. You know, and so for the parents on the platform, being, being spending that time to think about what type of husband you would like your son to become, what type of wife you would like your daughter to become. And what are the things, what are the conversations that we need to have? What are the spaces I need to, to, to put them in so that they can have access to this information, yeah? And begin to put these things into practice, even within the home. So that my son, let's say I'm in a single parent home as, as a mother, I teach my son to open the door for, for me, right? I teach him to, so there are things that I can teach him, you know, in terms of being able to communicate, you know, and, and, and understand what the woman may be going through. So it is, my answer to the question that, that is that more can be done, more can be done. Um, and I believe a big part of it starts with how we raise our, our boys and how we raise our girls. I don't want to leave the girls out as well, because that is, a, that is also a challenge that, that is out there, you know, where we raise an independent woman um, who cannot be interdependent in a marriage relationship. So we, so we, so we teach both of them, right, um, in terms of um, meeting the needs of your wife. But there are forums out there. I've been to several of them for the year so far. And I, be, you know what, I'm glad. I, I, because I, I mentioned that I went to four, and there's one more coming up that Dr. London is, is hosting that I'm a part of as well. So that would be five. Um, I'm glad because I'm seeing more of that co coming to the fore. I'm, I'm personally glad because the years gone by, you might see one for the year or not even, or none, you know, but there, there are more and more segments like these um, where the focus is on men, um, how they treat women, but also the needs that men have as well, right? I see a question here from Minister Nikisha. If your partner- Thank you very much, thank you very much. Sure, no problem, Minister. If your partner has narcissistic ways, how do you deal with him regarding letting him know what, what you want as a woman and ways he can address changing his approach to things? Um, you know, one of the things that I found that I find from counseling is that men tend to wait on things until things fall apart before they usually come for counseling. It is often when the wife packs up and she leaves. Then he realizes that, okay, I, need, I needed to make some changes. Nevertheless, um, in response to your question, um, one has to ask oneself, who does my husband respect? Who, in other words, who, who will he listen to? Because sometimes it is, you know, finding someone that you feel he will listen to or you may be able to receive from, I guess, let's say his father or even his mom. I mean, I'm, I'm saying that, but I'm saying it cautiously because I mean, you're, you're bringing other people into the relationship. You know, what I, what, I, what I like to say is that if the man is willing to work on his relationship, then he's willing to come for counseling. He's willing to, to be a part of group, group segments. Then once, he's, once he has that willingness, he will learn. I tend to stay away from the label of narcissism um, because when you meet someone that is truly, I mean, I've had clients who come in and say, my spouse is narcissistic and whatever. Yes, they may have one or two of the, the, the characteristics of, but when you meet someone who's truly narcissistic, you realize it can be very, very far removed from the person that you call husband. A lot of times it is selfishness that you're seeing. A lot of times what you're seeing is pride, you know? And I mean, I believe in praying for your husband. I believe in um, encouraging him maybe even learning how, how I can change my approach and communicating to him the needs that I have. Because sometimes um, the way needs are communicated 
and always received the messages that you send and always received. So let me give an, give an example. If my wife decides that, so let's say early, early in my marriage, I remember when I, I, I go down to the shop, buy a few snacks and come home and put on a movie and I'll watch the movie. And I remember my wife got upset. She gets silent, right? So I was trying to figure out what she was upset about. Why, why is she so quiet? And it was because I went to the store and I bought a snack for myself and I did not buy one for me, but for her, right? So she, so, so I knew that, all right, whatever I am, the ideas are whatever I'm buying for me, I ought to buy for her. If I'm considering me, I have to consider her as well, right? But the way she communicated that was with silence. Now, if we think about how we communicate this dissatisfaction in the relationship, if we think about how we communicate our needs, you may find that the way we communicate our needs may not always be in a healthy way. We may shout, we may scream, we may get silent, we may be disrespectful, we may do things that may push him food our way. Now, yes, I'm communicating. There's some things that I need from you. You know, there's some things that I want you to change. But the way I communicate it could also cause more damage to the relationship. So these are things to be mindful of. You know, how do I share with him the things that we need? Finding a nice time when you know he's in a good mood, or when you're having a little date night, and and choosing your words carefully, not words that will make him feel less than, which is sometimes what happens. You know, but 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 being very careful about what you say how you say it and you know and, and in a way that even empowers him you know babes when you do so 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 gosh it is making me feel so good you'd be surprised as opposed to you need to stop doing that oh you yeah, every time you do that so so so, so. the way we communicated could be could, could really cause some changes and sometimes um it is about getting him in spaces where he learns to do it different but also me being in spaces where i can learn to communicate my needs in a different way in a way that he could receive it because from what i've found working with men is that most men at least that i work with do want to have a good relationship you will ask them and yeah they want but they don't know how and they, they don't always know how to identify what your needs are because I would ask the, the husband, I would, when he comes in, I would say, so list out for me, this is something we do in therapy, list the needs that you have, that, that, that your wife has. What, what are her needs? And he will, he will struggle. He will struggle. And so I would give him it as a home assignment to go home and do. Because he, though he's seeing her crying, upset, angry, or being verbally loud or whatever, it, it doesn't translate to him that she needs emotional intimacy. She needs us to spend more time together. She needs me to give her more attention. Those things don't always translate to, to, the, to, to the man and his understanding of it. And if they don't, then it's like it goes over his head. Someone said men are from Mars or men are from Venus. And, and, and the same thing happens vice versa. And so he may not always be aware of what his wife needs in the way she needs it. And, and, and another thing, be very, be very specific in terms of what you, you need, um, Sister Nikisha. So I need more communication from my husband. What does that mean? That in terms like, like we use, you know, I need to be more specific. I need you, I need more time with you. What does that mean? It may mean that, all right, you go to work six days a week. Be, you have to be willing sometimes to take a day off and take me to the beach. Let's go to so, so, so. you know, be specific. Because he may be trying to figure out how does he, how should I communicate? How do I make more time for, for, for this really? I've given the only time that I have to, to my wife. But it, but it is not enough, you know? And so be specific. Tell him how. Tell him how. There's something I had to ask my wife to do. Tell me, tell me, be specific. Be specific. What, what you want to tell, how, how it should look like. How it should look like. She said, all right, buy me something nice. But don't buy it now because I now tell you about it. So if you buy it now, it wouldn't have the same meaning. It wouldn't carry the same weight. You have to just be moved to buy something at some opportune time. Now that is hard for me to understand. But what I had to do to, 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 to capture that is to set a little alarm or set it in my calendar to know, all right, do this. Send a little voice message. Send a little note. Put it in my calendar so that, so that I could help to meet the needs of my wife in the way she needs that, you know, in the way that she, she would appreciate it. So I hope I answered your question, um, Minister Nikisha. I think we have probably time for one or two more. Anybody else?
No one else? Right, well, thank you all so much for your questions. And uh, Destiny of Destiny Shalom Outreach Ministries for having me on the platform this evening. Um, and good conversation. I, I wish I always wish we had more men on it, you know, it's, it's, but it's, it's not always easy to get men to log in. And, uh, you know, this is about finding spaces that, you know, men can have access to the information in a meaningful way. Yeah. So, Pastor Dex, I turn over to you. Amen, my brother. Thank you so much. I see one person had their mic unmuted. I don't know if Miss um, Sister Coca has something she Miss wanted to ask. Oh, my mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. Could you mute your mic? Thank you. Thank you, Sister Coca. Um, Mr. London, thank you so much. Um, very, very um, informative. And I was at at the end of my seat sitting there. I'm saying, hmm. <laughs> you know, holding back myself, my brother. Um, I just want to ask you kindly to to you know to pray for the folks on the platform um, as we prepare to bring the curtains up. Yeah. Father God, we just we just give you all praise again. We thank you, oh God, for this time. Oh God, for this time, for everything that we covered, everything that was spoken about. Father, I pray for everyone on the platform. Father, I pray that they were able to receive. Oh God, I pray. Father, you know their situations. You know each person by name. You know their circumstances. Father, everything that concerns them with the with the man or men in their lives. Oh God, Father, I pray that um that those who needed to hear, Father Lord, that they will a part of the platform to this evening and they were able to hear and to receive. Father, I pray a special blessing over them, Father, for those that that you know um that 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 have let's say a spouse or or someone that they that they would have wanted to to be privy to the information that they'll be able to share it with them, oh God, um, that they would still be able to go online and, and listen to the to the segment. Father, I pray, oh God, for your covering over everyone on the platform. Father, I pray that everything that was shared, that it will go forth, oh God, in a special way. Um, Lord, that you will use it to minister to lives, oh God, that it will bring changes to relationships, to marriages. Father, for every young man that is on the platform, oh God, that it would have edified him, that he would have been able to, to add some new things to his toolbox, oh God, and that it would have helped him to become more prepared, oh God, for what the marriage relationship would entail, oh God. Father, we know that there is so much more to learn, oh God, and I pray that even as these segments continue, God, that you will continue to pour out to the people, pour out to the to the leadership team of Destiny Shalom Outreach Ministries, oh God, that they will that they will cover topics of oh Lord that is relevant, that is time timely, oh God, uh, that is spirit led, oh God. Father, I pray for a special blessing over myself and over everyone on the platform again, oh God. I pray God, that you will continue to keep us until another appointed time. We give you all honor and all glory that is due unto your name. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.